Well, thank you very much. Um, delighted to be here, and thank you to AWARE for the uh, invitation to speak here. Um, and thank you to you, especially for uh, coming out tonight on this particularly wet and uh, difficult night to get out. So well done. Um, okay, so the talk is divided into two pieces. The first is current status, and then the second bit is future directions. So on current status, um, I'd like to, to, to bring you through a current snapshot of where we are at the moment uh, with regards to gambling in Ireland. Um, obviously, that's from my point of view, but um, I'll try and give a rounded view of what the media, media are looking at and what science is looking at at the moment. Um, I think looking at the growth of technology is, is very, very important to, to place gambling within that because the last 10 years has seen a real change in what we're dealing with and that's very, very important to look at that. Um, I'm a psychiatrist and I guess some of you are involved in the treatment of mental health um, or addiction and I'll give you my perspectives on that. And then we look at um, the current classification because it is a medical illness, uh, a psychiatric illness and a medical illness and I think it's important to go over that. And then finally, um, obviously, we'll have a look at treatment. Um, future directions, I'll talk about some of my own research and the group of individuals that I work with um, research-wise, and then some of the initiatives from a responsible gambling point of view that are going to be uh, hopefully uh, brought in in Ireland uh, soon. So the current status is, uh, from the point of view of prevalence, we don't have exact prevalence figures, but if we were to put, try and make an estimation of it, we would uh, certainly be looking at the British Gambling Prevalence Survey or the Gambling Commission data in the UK, um, which is the best available data in the, in the UK. We tried to do our own prevalence survey and, and had ideas of getting thousands or even tens of thousands of people. Um, I see a nod there. <laughs> um, but we ended up with um, a few hundred. So gambling research is not easy. And if you want to do uh, you know, big prevalence surveys, you need either gov government behind it or you need a lot of money behind it. Um, so on, on, on a 1% uh, severe gambling problem, we're talking about 45,000 uh, in Ireland. And then from a gambling, uh, problem gambling, which would be about 5%, we're talking 200,000. So there's a lot of people in Ireland who are affected by this problem. Um, really depends where you look uh, with regards to the actual monies involved and the gross revenues. So I've seen estimates anything from one to eight billion. I'm not entirely sure how you, you, you calculate that, but you know, there's a lot of money involved in, in gambling. Bringing it back to the bread and butter of what we do and seeing people individually um, in the clinic, uh, you're talking debt. Anything, it could be any, any kind of meaningful debt to a person who maybe has less disposable income, it could be a thousand up to several million, depending on if the person is, is uh, operating with stocks and shares. Although you can still see gambling losses of millions, even with bookmakers, and there's a lot of, there's some media attention on that recently, um, where, where individuals were able to rack up that amount of debt. Um, without a shadow of a doubt, nearly every case that presents to us, it tends to present late, and it tends to present with, with people in quite a lot of distress, including um, family members in particular. We have very limited services across the country, and there's a lot of stigma associated with gambling. A, lot, a, a highly stigmatized condition, as is mental health, as is alcohol addiction, as is drug addiction. But perhaps with gambling, it's worse, it's worse, worse than everything else. There's just something about gambling that is more stigmatized. Now, of course, we can't quite prove that, although some studies look at that, and that's some research we're looking at at the moment as well. Um, 
very little regulation. Okay, we still have very outdated legislation there from the 30s and the 50s, and be a lot of focus on this. There's been a lot of focus over the last few years, and we have a new, um, Fianna Fáil just brought out a new bill in the last few weeks, the 2018 Gambling Control Bill. But we have been hoping that the 2013 Gambling Control Bill would have been brought in in the last few years. So it's a problem that's continuing this lack of legislation, and we do need it. Um, we also have uh, little restriction on advertising. That's a problem with regards to the amount of ads that kids uh, in particular see, and all of us see. Ofcom in the UK have data out and the amount of thousands and thousands of gambling ads that, that people will be exposed to every year. And a lot of our sporting events are very, very much linked with, um, with gambling, whether it's sponsorship or whether it's the ads in the middle of the event. And this is a, a figure that keeps coming up, this uh, 1 in 10 present for treatment. Okay, so there is an idea out there that 90% of uh, individuals don't uh, get treatment. And I'm often asked, well, what, well, what happens to them? And it's a difficult question. Some of them will end up in the criminal justice system. Some people just won't get treatment. Some people will end up depressed and some people will end up suicidal and some people will end up unfortunately dying because it is a serious condition when it's severe. Okay, so if we move on to just look at this overview of, the, of technology and, that, and how that's affecting um, how that's affected gambling, particularly in the last 10 years. So we, I think all of you will, will agree that we've had a significant growth of smartphone usage, right? Every graph you see, the graph is going like that. A few years ago, I used to give this talk, was at 60%. I, I presume it's, does anybody know what the, what the um, smartphone usage in Ireland is now? Well in the 90s, I'd say. Well in the 90s, okay. Thank you both for answering. <laughs> well done. <laughs> um, well, I, I'd say it is too. It must be, it must be up there. Um, the availability um, you know, of gambling you know, is 24-7 now. Okay, so there's really, we have no, if we want to access and you have the apps, you're there 24-7. Uh, we've also seen that with, um, it's not just gambling, it's porn, uh, internet gaming, which is video gaming online, and I'm going to come to that. Online shopping, you might think is a bit trivial. Uh, or it's great, uh, which is fine, it, it may well be for a lot of people, but for some individuals it can be problematic. In tandem with that, are we seeing a growth overall of process addictions? So that would be exercise. So we're seeing a growth of, of uh, bodybuilding or elite running. Triathlons are really popular now, they used to be before. So maybe, maybe all the processes are becoming more popular and it's not just gambling, but definitely technology uh, has played a huge impact in gambling. And we're starting to see now tech rehabs. So there are rehabs specifically for, for uh, technology. There's a few in the States. Uh, Restart is the name of one of them. So they're just like ordinary rehabs, but it's purely for technology and a lot of it is focused on adolescents. And they will uh, advertise its problematic internet use in general, which is internet use disorder, um, which is not yet a diagnosis, but perhaps it will be. Video game uh, or internet gaming disorder, which is in a holding position in DSM-5 at the moment. It may well be in DSM-6, be an actual addiction, but there's not enough evidence for that at the moment. And virtual reality is the other thing they talk about here, which I haven't seen very much of. But apparently there must, be, there must be a lot of it in the States. This is where you put a, uh, something like binoculars on and uh, it's like video gaming, but it's, it's, it's uh, called virtual reality. So anybody done virtual reality here? It's like a roller coaster, isn't it? So we have one. We might ask you later on in our, in our q and I better get on with the rest of this. <laughs> All right, we talked to you at the end. Um, now... So, uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to talk about the developments of, uh, 
of technology, in particular internet gaming, because this is important, because it sets the scene, and it is important for the current status, which is the first part of our talk. Um, so, I didn't know a lot about this, and it surprised me a lot um, when, I, when I started learning about it. And there's a very good uh, video, 10 minutes, I didn't include it here because it's a bit long, in The Guardian on eSports, and I advise you all to, to have a look at it to get an idea of what it's about. But basically, you have uh, uh, stadiums like you would have any sports, sporting event, and you have lots of young people, usually young people, possibly older people, I don't know, sitting around watching other people playing video games. And uh, this is, uh, let's go back actually, this is not trivial. The last line, more, more viewers watched the 2015 League of Legends final than the NBA final. So the point being that more people watch this than the basketball, which is their, one of their big sports. So it's not trivial. Um, you have millions there, 260 million online viewers in 2016. And what, what they're looking at is, the, is, is these massively uh, multiplayer online, either role-playing games or shooter games. And lots of kids are playing these now with their headsets and talking to each other. Um, and that's, that's, that's big in Ireland at the moment. I don't think eSports is big in Ireland at the moment, but in these internationally, this is at the end of a competition which looks like a normal sporting event. That could be GAA or it could be uh, soccer or rugby, whatever, except I don't know what, what stands out. Nothing really stands out. They look, look, I don't know, maybe two of the guys are wearing glasses um, where you probably wouldn't in sports and this guy's got something around his neck, which I, I don't know what that is. But um, this is important and it's important because Within gaming, we have what are called in-game microtransactions. And these are loot boxes, um, and this is an article from the Indo, sorry, the, the Irish Independent, a, f a few weeks back by Cathy Donaghy, um, focusing on, it was a, uh, uh, I think it was a teacher from Limerick and his kids, and he highlighted that his kids had spent hundreds of euro on, the, on these products within the games. Now you might say, well that's fine, what's, what's, what's the gambling piece there? But basically there is a monetary transaction here for particular products in the game. So it could be uh, star players, weapons or points. Um, but the key issue is it's random and there's a, it's, it's not a direct transaction. There's a randomized piece to that. And it can be presented in different ways where there is probably, you know, if you get the best, so you'll, it's, it's like spinning a wheel ultimately. And a lot of the international commentary is that this is uh, quite similar to, um, to gambling. The reports from Ireland at the moment is pretty relatively benign, several hundred euro, but abroad we're talking much, much uh, higher. There's reports of kids spending lots more money on that. So that's something that worries me a little bit with regards to where we're at at the moment. Um, the other thing that worries me is the expansion of gambling. Now, in the last 10 years, we've seen from, you know, pretty much in the clinic, people coming in with difficulties just with bookmakers or physically going into a bookmakers, very much crossing over into, into online and the predominantly what we'd see now is online with a mixture, a little bit of bookies, but mainly online. Um, there, there are many examples of how gambling is, is spreading across from sports into, you know, sports in South America at four o'clock in the morning to out from, from that into different areas of life. So I believe you can book on, I don't know, Celebrity Big Brother and... Uh, Whatever, whatever, whatever is, you know, there's politics coming into it as well. But the products out there, daily fantasy sports is an example. So normal um, fantasy football, you would have a whole season, okay? And it's based on a whole season, it's slow. But what's happening is all of that is starting to compress into one day. And people pay varying amounts of money. It could be 25 cent, up to 5,000 euro to enter, and the pools can be quite high. 
So again, the commentary on this internationally is, is it a form of gambling? And you see up the top, what's right up the top, DFS, daily fantasy sports players exhibit many of the behaviors of traditional gamblers. So the studies are looking at the similarities between gamblers and fantasy sports playing. So for me, the importance of this is that gambling is spreading out into various different platforms and uh, into different areas of life. Um, so that's a worrying feature. So gambling and psychiatry, um, there is a definitive link between uh, gambling and suicide. Um, a very serious condition um, at the severe end, okay? So not all problem gabl gambling is associated with mental health issues, but the more you go towards the end, the pathological end, the more problems you have with this. So up to 50% of treatment of, of people in treatment have had suicidal ideation, which is a pretty powerful statistic, with 17% of people having attempted uh, suicide in, in treatment cohorts. 10% of individuals with bipolar affective disorder will have problem gambling. Half of these cohorts having gambled within the last 12 months, and these cohorts tend to be younger and have an earlier onset of illness. There's a higher suicide risk in bipolar affective disorder cohorts that have comorbid gambling. And type two bipolar has a greater risk of gambling disorder than type one. And 6% in major depression cohorts would be another statistic. Um, DSM-5, I'm just taking these directly out of, out of DSM-5, um, the, the book, and there are many potential differential diagnoses, but the main, main ones would be non-disordered gambling, um, otherwise known as professional. Um, this would be individuals who could demonstrate a lot of control and a lot of risk management. And in the US, you, uh, I think you've, you, the, the tax system in the US, would, you, you, your returns would demonstrate that if you handed in tax returns. So um, I've met some, some professional gamblers and definitely the, um, the presentation there is different to a problem gambler. However, at particular times, I think some professional gamblers would say that there are periods when they don't feel fully in control. So it's a difficult area, that. Um, social gambling, of course, 90% of people will gamble, just like 90% of people will take drugs, and 90% of people will drink alcohol uh, without a difficulty. And that's the reality. What we deal with in clinical services is, is that, well, 5% to 10% of people who have a difficulty. And, around our regulation and our legislation, sometimes that's lost, is that you know, a lot of people are going to gamble without a problem. Uh, mania or bipolar affective disorders, clearly somebody can exhibit or engage in excessive uh, behaviors. One of them could be gambling, and that's very important to exclude um, that diagnosis. Personality disorders, I think, is, is going to be a differential diagnosis for gambling as well, not particularly common, and other medical conditions, uh, Parkinson's, which I'll come to in a minute. So the comorbidities, again, from DSM-5, but uh, I've added in maybe a little bit from Mark Griffith's paper, um, 2000, 2003 paper in the BMJ, his editorial called Betting Your Life on It, um, which was his first, which was really the first paper to announced to the medical community, really, um, that gambling, you, you know, it was really written, it was an excellent paper, but written very much in the style of, you know, time to wake up here to a very serious uh, medical issue um, that needs to be taken very seriously. Um, poor general health sounds a bit vague, but I think when you see somebody who has been gambling for several weeks on end and do, having done nothing else, you get an idea of what that means. People are just generally not well. Getting more specific, they may have rapid heartbeat or tachycardia, angina or heart pain, or chest pain, sorry. Um, other addictions are going to be common. 
and um, smoking. Um, high rates of comorbidity you're going to get with gambling, depression, anxiety, and personality disorder. Um, the other things that uh, are a little bit more um, worrying are an increased rate of violence, particularly towards partners and children, and migraine as well, which is a bit vague again. But, um, the personal cost for individuals, irritability, and this is very much how people may present, uh, irritability, moodiness, mental illness, uh, problems with personal relationships including divorce, absenteeism from work, neglect from family, all of that you'd expect from any uh, addiction, that, that's really, you know, that's generic ad addiction stuff. And then the last bit where gambling differs is the impact on finances, so bankruptcy. Um, now, the current classification is important. In May 2013, this is the DSM-5, which was the updated version before that. Uh, gambling was in impulse control disorders section, which was in the same category as uh, trichotillomania, hair pulling, or, uh, need to check it, possibly nose picking, um, and various other somewhat what would be viewed as somewhat trivial um, disorders. Um, that, not trivial, but maybe that didn't have enough evidence as some of the other uh, conditions in, you know, say, say in drug and alcohol addiction, which had a lot of research behind it. 10 years of research in different areas meant that gambling then would go into um, the addictions category. Now it's actually on its own. In, in, in this gambling disorder, but it has the same weight now as alcohol and drug addiction. And the reason for that is because of the uh, evidence in these particular areas, clini clinical neuroimaging and neuropsych research. Um, it's important because, well, number one, it was the first condition, a first process addiction to be an addiction, if you know what I'm saying. It's also important because there's a number of other addictions in the process addiction category that want to be addictions and they're not currently allowed to be addictions depending on where, you know, depending on which part of the world you're coming from. So to explain, if you're from Asia at the moment or Southeast Asia and you have uh, reports of a prevalence of 40% of internet gaming disorder, you've got super, quali you know, super high quality broadband and you've got, you know, uh, very sophisticated uh, video games. If you're a doctor in that country, you're going to be seeing a lot of people who have problems with that, and you're going to be saying this should be in the classificatory system. If you're elsewhere in the world, you're probably saying, well, we're not really seeing that. Um, so it boils down to these three areas. Currently, um, the DSM people are saying not enough information. So I'm just going to take you through um, the first one, clinical, for gambling. One of the previous slides I was saying to you, this is generic addiction. All the stuff is generic addiction. Um, the similarities between gambling and gambling disorder and alcohol and drug addiction are very, very similar. So you have, the problem is persistent and recurrent. You've got clinically significant impairment or distress. You've got central uh, features of addiction described by Griffith Edwards that became the pillars of addiction, such as loss of control, tolerance, meaning you need to say drink more to have the same desired effect, gamble more to have the same desired effect, take more drugs to have the same desired effect, and withdrawal symptoms. You pull the substance away, you get a series of, of uh, physical problems, mental problems, cravings. And the, so you see all of that with gambling. So that's the first thing. But on its own, that, that isn't going to be enough. The, the classificatory um, people would want to see other evidence. And that other, other evidence will firstly, well, depends which, which way you're coming from. If, you, if you're into this kind of research, you're going to say, well, this should be first. But we, won't, we don't need to go into that now. But um, the important research that got gambling into DSM-5 one of them was uh, neuroimaging. Now, genetic studies was in there as well, but not to the same extent. But mainly, there was a whole series of neuroimaging studies that showed that within these particular parts of the brain, you had deficits. 
So any of you who are in neuroimaging, I, I, I did genetics, not neuroimaging, so you can have a good laugh to yourselves at my, 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 uh, my, my attempts here to describe it. But um, the, in these particular areas, so this ventromedial prefrontal cortex, now that is familiar to anybody who does addiction because these are the key areas where you see problems. In this case, it's neuroimaging. In this case, you would see hypoperfusion or underperfusion of particular areas of, of the brain here if you put somebody in, a, in an MRI scanner, okay? And similarly here, dors dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Those areas are associated with risk processing, okay? Risk assessment, planning, okay? All the things that are involved if you're going to be, I talked about professional gambler earlier, that the professional gambler might have to show the control. However, a problem gambler will have a loss of control. So ultimately what the studies look at is getting people to do particular tasks within a scanner, so they're functional studies, so they can be doing gambling, uh, gambling tasks or actually gambling, and it shows that there's deficits in those areas. Now, that's okay, but in combination, if you get people then, take them out of the scanner and put, put these individuals in a, a lab setting, you see that within uh, these tests, these batteries of neuropsychological tests that psychologists use, they're able to say that depending on, the, on, on, on what happens during that test, they can start to hone in on these areas again. So you're getting convergence of the evidence towards these particular parts of the brain. Okay, and the type of test there, are gratification, you know, going for gratification over delayed rewards, that's a Nancy Petrie study, and she was actually, she's actually involved, she was one of the main spokespersons, spokespeople around um, internet gaming disorders saying, not enough evidence, we need to see more of these type of studies. Place higher wages and probabilities, so that's more in, that's like putting more in on, on, on just being more risky, and poor learning then, when things go wrong, you're not pulling back. So these are all the kind of things when you see somebody clinically in front of you and the, 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 the person will be there and, and their, their loved ones will be there and, and the whole interaction is based on seeing the person, how sick they are, that they're unable to, you know, they, 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 you can actually see these in front of you in the clinic where, where the individual um, says that they, they're continuing to gamble um, in the face of all kinds of difficulties, and they just can't stop. Um, a little addendum to, to gambling uh, inclusion in DSM-5 was, um, was Parkinson's, which was that extra little piece of um, the jigsaw that certainly helped. Um, and this, this relates to, in, in certain individuals, if they were being seen in, your, in neurology clinic for Parkinson's disease for a deficit of dopamine, they were given drugs which increased dopamine, which I think was pretty well known probably within, within your neurology that there would be compulsivity, so there could be increased behaviors, could be sexuality or, or shopping, but really, more recently, the focus was on gambling, and certainly that's what we were referred, was individuals who'd never gambled before in their life, or maybe they had very minor gambling, and then started gambling in a very compulsive way, out of nowhere. Now, that again brings us back to, you know, what's going on in these particular, these are dopamine-rich areas as well, and I know every addiction talk, you have to talk about dopamine, but trying to be a little bit more specific, those particular areas are dopamine rich and that would tie in with a dopamine theory. Now some people would say, well it's totally oversimplified. Um, but doesn't Parkinson's make it a little bit more simple for some individuals, okay? Not everybody obviously who's treated uh, with dopamine agonists become uh, pathological gamblers, but therein lies the inter-individual variability and why some people which probably ties in again with the genetics, why do some people become addicted and others don't? It's that um, golden question. Okay, so criteria, we um, we'll go through these relatively um, quickly. Um, so that's the definition in DSM, it's persistent recurrent problematic gambling leading to clinically significant impairment or distress as indicated by the individual exhibiting four or more 
of the following in a 12-month period. How did they get to four? Well, that's a really good question. I don't really have an answer to that. Um, but some, somewhere in the committee, they decided, well, we're going to go with four. But I, in fairness, I think the reason probably is that every, every feature you have up here, they're pretty cardinal features of problems. So the first one needs to gamble with increasing amounts of money in order to achieve the desired excitement. Um, you know, is, is, that, is that really, could you have that and, and not have a problem? Not really, because again, you should be controlling it. You shouldn't need to, to keep upping the stakes or upping your frequency, upping the amount of so time, uh, your bet amount, the amount of time you're playing. So these are all subtle indicators. When you put them all together, obviously, when you see the severe problem, um, it can be obvious. Restless or irritable when attempting to cut down or stop gambling. So that's... I mean, that's, that's withdrawal symptoms, and you could see that in any addiction. Has made re repeated attempts to cut down or stop gambling. Um, does, is that necessary? Absolutely not, because you can, we often see people who, we talk about the periods of abstinence. That's a very important question when you're taking somebody's history. Like, what, what, what's the greatest period of abstinence that you've had? It may be an intentional or unintentional. Sometimes people say, oh, I gave up alcohol for Lent, or I gave up um, whatever. Um, often it's important to ask them why, why it was. It might, might be that I was sick or I was, you know, I was in hospital, I physically couldn't gamble, all right? But if it's, if it's a self-imposed and it was preceded by an attempt to stop um, and then you keep relapsing after that, that indicates you know, an ongoing problem. Uh, four, preoccupation. Now that's, that's, that's particularly important with gambling and I would argue that it's worse than, it's often when you see it, it's the preoccupation. So often we would see that you young people, young men who are, you know, they've, they've phone like this and the, they're, they're with friends or, or their family is, is typical and, and they're not, they're just not interacting. And that, that can go on for ages and then it escalates into the family will will um, try and intervene, do, do, a, do an intervention of sorts, ask what's going on, and you start to see amounts of aggression kicking in and, you know, F off or that type of thing, or going up to, up to, up to their room. Um, again, you'll say, well, hey, that's not going to be an addiction, but it's when it's put together with some of the, some of the other features, it, it, it starts to look like addiction. Often gambles when feeling distressed, e.g. helpless, guilty, anxious, depressed, yeah, and, and it's the same as drinking on, drinking on something, drinking on or taking drugs on. You'll often hear people saying, I drank on that, or it was, a, it was a, 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 you know, a grief situation or bad news or even sometimes good news. Um, losing money, after losing money, gambling often returns another day to get even. Now, that's probably one specific for gambling. You don't hear people when they've had a lot of alcohol that they return another day to get even. Uh, well, you, well, you, well, you hear, you hear I, I don't know, you hear, I mean, one of the cardinal features of alcohol dependence would be relief drinking first thing in the morning. Um, so, uh, but this chasing losses is, is huge, isn't it? Because part of the psyche in gambling is that you have a magnific mag magnification of gambling skills and it's always based you need a certain amount of competition. You need to feel that you're going to get it even. You need to have a certain amount of confidence in yourself. Um, so that is absolutely crucial. And there's a huge, huge amount of work done in the neuro on the neurobiology of chasing losses, mainly a group in Oxford. Um, because if you can crack that, you can probably crack the whole condition. Um, Seven, lies to conceal the extent of involvement with gambling. I mean, that's pretty much lying, deceiving, manipulating. You see, you're not going to get that in any, any addiction. What would I say it's worse than, I mean, it's particularly, it's particularly difficult with gambling, whereby you, it really hurts families. I mean, this is, this is the piece where, where, where it really does affect, um, it, it presents so late and, the, there's often no warning signs. You know, with, with other addictions, families can tell that there's something up or loved ones can tell there's something up. But gambling tends to present that bit later and it tends to be associated with more 
of the defense mechanisms that people have to protect themselves and to keep the, the gambling going in the face of adverse consequences, that being lies, uh, deceit, manipulation, none of that is, I would argue, is, is, is uh, deliberate. It's an illness, and there, this is the illness feature. These are the illness features. Um, jeopardized a uh, relationship, job, educational, career opportunity because of gambling, again, that would be generic, and relies on others to provide money to relieve desperate financial situations caused by gambling. We're very, very common. I don't think we'll, we'll ever take a history of a gambling problem without, um, you know, uh, some, you know, money coming from somewhere. Often it's, it's theft, uh, often it's borrowing, um, often it's diversion of, of, you know, not paying the mortgage or whatever. Uh, so mild, the, the criteria then are divided into mild four to five, moderate six to seven, and severe eight to nine criteria being met. Um, treatment, um, like, like all uh, addictions, uh, I would argue like um, all mental, well, not all, but most mental health issues uh, and most chronic, and this is the important bit, most chronic medical illnesses because sometimes gam gambling is stigmatized into a position where, oh, well, you know, why can't you get people better? Uh, you know, there's, if there's an, a cure expected, it's just like any other medical condition. Some people will be cured, and they, well, not cured, but they'll, they will get better. They will not have a further episode of gambling. But um, in other cases, um, it is relapsing and remitting. Okay, so I, I don't see why that's different to any other medical condition. Of course, it's fiercely debated, and some will hold the view that this is a, it's not a medical illness, it's not uh, any kind of illness, and, um, and that's it. Um, so next point there, treatment history and periods of abstinence. So that is really, the, one of the most important aspects of treatment is actually getting to know what the actual problem is, because within the gambling disorder umbrella, every case is very, very different. If you listen to, to testimonies of you know, people who've suffered from this condition, each case is, is, is very similar in many regards, but very different. It's, it's, there can be just the way people get money, the way they keep the problem going, the way they hide the problem, the way they cope with the problem, the way they're physically with the problem, the way their mental health is with the problem, it varies so much. Um, so getting that information is the first part of treatment and knowing it as a treatment team is so important. I mentioned the periods of abstinence already and you know, it is a, it's an indicator of somebody's ability. If somebody says to me, well, I, I didn't gamble for five years between you know, 2011 and 2015, uh, 16, if I do my maths right, um, I'm, 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 I'm thinking fantastic, you know? I'm thinking that is a, that is a fantastic, um, if it's true, uh, thing to work with. Uh, stabilization is often forgotten, right? So what, is, what does stabilization mean? Um, so if somebody has been chaotically gambling, the first thing you do is get people into a situation where they can actually get their heads straight. And, you know, often people come into us, they want to do a, um, well, they say, well, I don't need a detox because I wasn't drinking or I wasn't taking drugs, so I'm, I want to go on the program. And that's fine, but I think if you're suffering from a gambling disorder, you deserve time to stabilize. Now, what that often means is coming away from your phone. I um, uh, heard a piece on, on the radio yesterday about breaking up with your phone. Um, there's a book out at the moment. A book just came out on breaking up with your phone. So, and there was the first part. There was two parts to it. And I think in the second part, you didn't actually fully break up with it, but you just developed more healthy relationships. So our stabilization would be similar in that, you know, you got to come away from the phone. And I, I mentioned porn, internet gaming um, at the top as well. And that would go for those, any, anything where there is a phone basis to the problem. It could be internet use disorder, 
perhaps we're going to see more of that, where, the, where just the problem is disparate, it's across the board, it is just unhealthy and problematic to the extent that it's causing serious problems, um, purely just use of the phone or computer. And the jury's out at the moment regarding that, internationally in the literature. Um, finances is a big one, so people will be very distressed at the situation they're in with regards to finances and work. And often the stabilization period is just taking time to, to gather ourselves around that. Risk is obviously a key issue um, for, for everything that I've outlined, particularly on the crossover with psychiatry. Um, triggers are going to be a huge issue in, I mean, any, any time we're going to talk about addiction, it's going to be what triggers the problem. And that could be huge. If you skip to the last line there, live sport is... Sometimes we'll ask people to maybe record, not look at sport live if people have to look at sport. Um, sometimes we say to people, don't watch sport at all. Um, that really depends on, 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 on your collaboration with the individual in treatment and what they're prepared and what they can do. Um, the phone at the end also is obviously the portal in, 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 these, in these problems is the phone. So we, we often as a basic we will advise people to get off a smartphone and go on to what we call the old school Nokia phones. Um, and I saw Nokia brought out an old school phone recently which I thought was very interesting. Um, we, we're not, we don't just say Nokia just for the record. Um, it, could be any, it could be any phone that basically doesn't have, if you go back 10 years ago, did, doesn't have the capabilities that it has now. That can be very problematic, and it can be, you know, if people have to work. Um, it's the same thing if you have a publican that comes for treatment for alcoholism, and you say, well, you shouldn't really go back. You shouldn't be in, 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 in a pub situation. And they say, well, thanks for that, but that's my job. Um, so you have to, you know, there's practicalities around this as well. Um, cash is a huge issue. Um, we would usually ask that the individual would nominate somebody and divert all of their, their money to, sometimes in kids it's, it's to parents, in married couples it's to the spouse, um, but cash really you know, is, is, is a huge part of the problem. You might ask, well, how long does that go on for? It really goes on for as long as a person is healing and doing well. You often hear two years in addiction as, as the time period of recovery, but it's a bit arbitrary. Um, generic ad addiction services is a super important point because you're not going to get specific gambling services in Ireland. In the UK you're, there is a national problem gambling clinic in Soho in London but again it's limited, the funding is limited and they're overrun with referrals. So um, if, if we get investment in Ireland in this, for this particular condition, and we might just um, we might just do that, depending on how things are going at the moment. The indications are, you know, if 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 the current legislation comes through, well, then there will be a signi significant social fund, which will allow for the uh, for for specific services nationwide for the two hundred thousand people that we talked about. Um, now I'm really scraping at the surface here. There's so I could really, t we could have done the, you know, the whole talk on this alone. But I'll give you the, I'll give you the headlines on it. Self exclusion. Um, well, it's voluntary self exclusion, isn't it? So that's a bit of a, you know, you could argue well, that that makes no sense. There's no logic to that. It, I mean, it's somewhat effective, but it's not for somebody with a severe gambling problem. Self exclusion doesn't work because there's always ways. Re-entry is the term, ways of getting back in. And similarly, there's various types of blocking software. But again, there's, there's so many ways around that. One of, one of the ways we might get around that is, is by making uh, limit setting mandatory. And very few countries have gone that way. But um, there has been recent, I'll come to it in a minute under regulation because I'm skipping ahead. Um, now, medication. I'll mention naltrexone because we use it. Um, it is licensed for a treatment, FDA licensed and UK licensed for treatment of alcohol dependence. It's not technically licensed for a gambling disorder, but is used. 
and the standout studies would be uh, John Grant's study there from quite a long time ago. But um, and we'd also look at using naltrexone in other where we have comorbidity in alcohol and say shopping. I mentioned shopping earlier and mentioned that it might be seen as trivial. But you know, for some individuals who fill their houses with unwanted goods and they're not manic, that's a serious process addiction. When you see it and you see the distress associated, you see the impact that it has on the family. So just to say naltrexone has a wide, it can have a wide base of use. It will be effective for some and it won't be effective for others. And you might ask, well, why? Well, that's because there's inter-individual inter variability, again, probably genetically driven, that some people's addiction is driven by the opioid system and other people's, other people's <coughs> addiction isn't. Um, so, you know, addiction, we see it as a heterogeneous group of problems, not just a unitary thing like, you know, a simple thing like their dopamine isn't right. Um, okay, so SSRIs and mood stabilizers would have been trialed as well, but they're not used. Okay, but they, if, if there's comorbidity with gambling, of course, we'd look at, at those drugs as well. Um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is um, effective. All of the studies would show it is effective, just like in um, depression. And um, often with depression, it is the combination of um, CBT or, or, or anxiety disorders, the combination of CBT and medication is better than either alone. We haven't quite got to that stage with gambling. What, what we do know is that uh, CBT is effective. Um, there are some of the cognitive distortions there. I've, I've touched on some of them. The magnification of the, of the skills, that's the most problem gamblers will feel that they will fix the problem in the end um, through this ma sense that they, 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 they know what they're doing. Um, they tend to be competitive. Fallacy is a series of losses will, ne it will inevitably lead to a win. Um, and you see all sorts of magical thinking um, in gambling. Um, so the recovery patterns then are identifying, uh, sorry, the recovery um, process within CBT, with, with a CBT therapist would be ident identifying distortions and generating alternatives. Now that's quite generic, it's the same as depression or anxiety where you're looking at f what the Americans would call stinking thinking and you're putting in more adaptive forms of thinking. Um, the behavioral piece is social skills training um, assertiveness, you might think, well, what's that about? Well, very, very important, actually. Um, you see, I, I call it adult peer pressure. I mean, peer pressure is thought to be in adolescence in around 15, 16. Genetic studies would show that, that it's a very high environmental influence around, the, around those uh, times. But we see it clinically all the time. We see pressure on people to continue with a particular behavior, be it drinking, drugs, and I suspect in, in young men in Ireland who sit around with their smartphones and are in play betting the whole time when there's sports on, there probably is a lot of pressure on, on, on young men in particular within certain groups to gamble. Um, so, so, you know, obviously the, the treatment would be looking at the, how do you assertively, you know, for, for want of a better kind of terminology, you know, not to be bullied into it and to, to assertively stand back. Sometimes we, we would just say just move away from the peer group. So a lot of young men would have a gambling um, peer group and it's as, as AA or GA would say, it's people, places, things. So you want to remove the people and the places. So you stay, stay away from gambling places and you stay away from the people who are gambling as well. Um, okay, and high risk, identif identification of high risk, high risk situations is similar to triggers, so knowing when you're going to gamble and, and your risky, um, risky situations. So I've already said that, that CBT is effective, and meta-analysis would, would show that as well. So there's a Gooding and Tarrier 2009, that's probably a pretty emphatic meta-analysis. Um, okay, future directions. So this was our um, online survey, um, which um, was to end of December into June and we well we completed the study and we learned a few things along the way that it's not easy to to it's not easy to publicize gambling um, or a gambling study 
um, and you need probably need a lot of resources to you know to to do this on a, on a large scale but we did it on a smaller scale and the, the the results were pretty interesting this stuff here is 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 really just the intro stuff as you'd expect sports betting was the most popular mobile app the most commonly used device and the main reason to gamble was to win money and there's a whole we have a whole table there of breaking why people would gamble but really the important bits are 75% and this is th these are items taken from the problem gambling severity index which is a problem gambling screen 75% of, of people had to borrow money to fund gambling. Um, I think this, the, the latter part of that was to sell something, borrow money or sell something, yeah. 64% felt um, they had a problem with gambling, 62% had bet more than they could afford to lose, and 76% um, said the dangers should be advertised. 59% said they were strongly agreed or agreed that they would prefer to gamble on websites which regularly told them how much they had lost. Uh, so, you know, on a small sample, you would probably be saying, well, you got problem gamblers or, it, you know, it's skewed because it's just a very particular type of person would have filled that out. That's fine, but it's still, it's still indicating that the people who filled out our survey were probably, you know, had significant problems, which, uh, which tallies with what we're seeing clinically. Um, what are we going to do next? We're going to, as I said already, we're going to look at stigma. I think it's a massive problem. I think it's, it's, it's probably gambling's perhaps out there on its own. Service provision nationally, we're, going, we're looking at that at the moment. What's available and what, where are the gaps? Sporting bodies, we're, we're, um, we're continuing to enthusiastically to, to look for collaborations within sporting bodies. And we'll, we, we're, we're remaining optimistic that that will end... Uh, that we'll get a good result from that in the end. And we're also looking then at RG, Responsible Gambling Initiatives. Um, and uh, we have we've a team working on that at the moment. Um, now, I'm just, just, there's a few slides left and just, um, I'll summarize these. Ultimately with the legislation, um, so the legislation we have at the moment is 2013 gambling control bill is what's on the table that will hopefully be be um, um, put into law. Um, Fianna Fáil have tabled the 2018 version, which I just saw yesterday. Actually, um, they did a press release on it, and and uh, I think it's very very like the 2013 gambling control bill. At the start of the year, the minister, uh, Dennis Stanton, indicated that they would go a, a different route um, where they'd have an independent regulator, which is very, very good. But Fianna Fáil are saying, hang on, we'll stick with what we had from 2013 and we'll go with that. We'll just, it's, it's fine, it works well. Um, hopefully we'll get something. Um, now, one of the things that, that, that was in last weekend, the Irish, Irish edition of the, the, um, the English Times ran a story on Stuart Kenny, the um, uh, ex, um, well, the founder and ex-CEO of Paddy Power um, suggested um, limit setting. And this is a, um, timely and a very welcomed intervention from an important person from the industry. Um, so ultimately, you can limit deposits, plays, loss, losses and bets. And critically at the moment, any of the limit setting is voluntary. But the proposal would be that this would be mandatory. Now, there's been various interpretations of this. Um, but what would essentially, in my view, would work in Ireland is that people would go on Everybody gambling would have to do it. Now, that's going to be a pain for the 90% of people that don't want to do it. But if we look at the societal effects of gambling at the moment, perhaps those people would say, well, okay, 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 it's a pain, but I'll do it because I know how bad it can be for the people who are unable to control where I can control. There's also other options and pop-up messaging while you're gambling. And... Uh, other, other options like customer interaction, so this is at the bookie level where, where, where staff can actually 
you know, look at people who are potentially in trouble. But a lot of the issues there, staff will say they're not trained, they're not psychologists, they're not psychiatrists, which is reasonable. The other thing is behavioral profiling on online systems. You can actually tell, really, can't you, who people are out of control. So maybe those data could be used to help people. Um, age verification, different uh, approaches in different countries. Um, in Sweden, you have, to, you, you have to use your social security um, card to show that you're a resident of, of, that, of the jurisdiction. Credit cards, not very helpful because I know, um, there are, you know kids can get their parents' credit cards and I've been told that in schools many times by the kids. Um, a player card system, other countries in Norway had that where you had to re register if you want to gamble may help, and then challenging, just on the ground, actually challenging. And another suggestion recently that is that you'd have secret shoppers on the ground within bookmakers paid by the independent regulator to make sure that kids aren't gambling. Um, last, last two slides. Um, have to, yeah, we'd have to talk about FOBTs, or fixed odd, odds betting terminals, dubbed the crack cocaine of gambling. Um, now, their association of British bookmakers uh, stats there saying that they say that every nine, their date would be every nine minutes. Uh, sorry, a person would spend nine minutes and have 33 to 39 plays. They'd spend 45 British pounds in that time, of which seven was lost. Um, whereas the media reports would say that you have um, impoverished individuals in probably deprived areas, um, taking their full wage packet and putting it into the machine, uh, the EGM, le electronic gaming machine, within minutes and it's all gone. Um, so, and, 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 and clinically there's no question that there are examples of this. So, um, there's varying reports as to why we don't have FOBTs, but the good news is we don't, and we certainly don't want them, ever. Um, the, uh, there was a suggestion that they were maybe going to make, a, make, make an appearance in 2009, but there was interventions behind the scenes and they didn't make it in. Uh, the good news, the gambling control bill, it, they're not in, they're, they're specifically banned. But I, I see a quote again in, in the weekend's paper, uh, again the Irish, Irish edition of the English Times stating that there was a source from Paddy Power were concerned that the online casino piece of um, uh, when they looked at their data, it resembled, quote, this is the quote, um, it resembled fixed odds betting terminal behavior. So I think that's an interesting point. And, you know, perhaps there's a core to people that after the nightclubs or after the pubs are, are going on and they're gambling in a very, very disruptive way. And part of the commentary recently has been that mandatory limit setting, if you say at this particular time, I'm going to gamble 200 a month only, I'm going to be locked out um, for three months on that. Uh, sorry, I'm, I, I, that cannot be changed for three months. And if I go over the 200, I'm going to be locked out. Well, then that's it. Okay, and then you can't, you know, hook up the credit card and lose five or 6,000 euro that night or even more. So I think that, that would help a lot of people. And last but not least, I think I've, I've mentioned gambling control bill. There's also going to be a levy on operators. That's, that's, you know, if you think about the potential turnover, or sorry, the turnover, the potential, if there's a levy of 1% up to whatever percent, that could be very substantial, which would mean we could lead the way with regards to, to services and research. Um, and... I've said it again, <laughs> of, of 2018, still no legislation. How many times have I said that? Um, and finally, advertising, of course, we want to, we have to get, we have to get a hold on advertising because at the moment uh, we're being bombarded with ads. So thank you very much for, for your time tonight, guys. Cheers. Thank you.